Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. We're glad you're here. I just realized that we have a major PowerPoint problem, and it's my fault. So, Jim, what you need to do, um, let's hear it again. <laughs> and I'll get this straightened out for us real quick. I know. That's what I forgot to do. Here, let's get over here. I know. It was, but oops, I went too far. Okay. should be no yeah but you got to get rid of these or it won't go there I think okay close all right let's do the current slide There is no rest of the show. There's no slideshows there. Um, okay. Uh -oh. <coughs> well, we can't because it keeps going back to the other show. Custom shows. There are none. Let's, um, okay. now let's see if it'll go. Goodness. Here. Well, that's no. No, we'll work. This is what we're going to do. We're going to take sides away. Shift. <coughs> But it's it's doing it now. Yeah, it's it's working now. We just we just keep clicking forward. I think we got it. Well, if we get stuck, we'll get stuck. But we'll see if we can get. I apologize for that. One simple little thing, and everything is messed up. So, good morning! <laughs> We're glad you're here to worship with us today. A uh, couple of announcements. Um, there are a couple of services, special Sundays that are coming up. Ascension is today, Pentecost next week, Memorial the next, and then our series on foundational prayer concludes the following with communion. Uh, I'll be at the base of the ramp again to have conversations with you if you'd like to come out, go out that exit and stop and talk. Uh, at noon, there will be a Zoom fellowship time. Wednesday morning at 9.30, the Zoom Bible study group. 
has completed their study on the Bible, but they still, still continue to meet at 9.30 for the prayer portion of that group for about a half hour or so. so and everyone is welcome to tune in to that on the Heartland web, website, Zoom site. You can support the church by donating through various means, by dropping off a mail in the check or to the office, or by using your banking online system or our, our church's website. Or you can place your gift in the donation box outside of the sanctuary. We give because it makes a difference that we cannot do on our own. Romans 12, 13 says we contribute to the needs of God's people and practice hospitality. By sustaining the church, we main opportunities to connect in ways with each other that, and our world that we could not do on our own. I think COVID has helped us realize that more than ever that uh, you don't know how important something is to your life till you can't experience it for a while, the way you used to, at least. Today, we want to thank Kathy, who will accompany all of the music while Donna is away. Uh, Jim Cleveland is in the technology booth. Mary Jo Bell is going to sing a special for us. And our lay reader is Jerry Weaver. We thank all of you in the room for coming and your patience with me. And we thank and all of those who are tuning in at home as well. I don't know much about my family's heritage on my father's side, but I know they did have sheep when they were growing up. His experience of them was the normal stereotypical picture we hear about them. Dumb, weak, defenseless, helpless. They fall on their back just in a little tiny gully. They can't get back up on their feet, and they could even suffocate if you don't get them back right. Short-sighted he used to say. Others add that they are easily startled by the unexpected. They tend to wander away because of the focus on feeding from one spot to the next to the next and the next. And they have a mob mentality. One near them gets spooked, they all get spooked, and then, you know. Um, and they graze in a way that's so destructive that it endangers other wild animals in some places of the world. And when people are called sheep, they are assigned nearly all of these qualities, as well as blindly following others without discernment. Studies of sheep, however, have shown that nearly all these qualities are wrong. It is true that when they fall on their back, they're pretty helpless, and they're in trouble. And that in lean food times, the sheep compete with wild animals for pasture and leave nothing edible for those wild animals. On the other hand, their eyesight is not weak, it's powerful. They have almost a 300-degree peripheral vision. <laughs> they can see almost right straight behind them. And when they focus forward with both eyes together joined, they almost have binocular vision. They easily spot predators, in other words. Hmm. And they can run. And they can climb well. Or if needed, especially defending their children, they have a pretty powerful kick. And they used to have horns, although most of that has been bred out of the domestic versions. They develop fiercely loyal friendships, fighting with their friends when among challengers and assisting others in the flock who need help. They are generally mild-mannered. They can use sight, smell, and sound to distinguish individuals from each other and remember them for a long time, better than most people can, and especially me. And they do follow the ones they have learned to trust will lead them well, be they shepherds or well-trained sheep dogs. They are not undiscerning animals. So now I invite you to close your eyes. We've all seen images of flocks in the fields. Let that image refill your minds. Shepherds and those that know of their work throughout the ages would know better than the narrow stereotypes we have heard or experienced and anthropomorphized. It is because of that deeper understanding that it became a favorite and more positively viewed illustration of teachers who lived in those cultures. Move into the green pasture. Be the sheep. The warm sun is on your back. Your friends surround you. You see the rich provision the shepherd has given. 
You see his tools of protection. You hear his familiar, soothing voice bringing us comfort and calling us to his side. See the still waters at the edge of the pasture to quench our thirst. Keep all this sheep and shepherding image in your minds as we hear key thoughts lifted from Psalm 26. We rely on the Lord to keep us from falling. We remember his faithful love. We stay away from those voices and those things that would lead us astray. We remember and depend on his faithful love. We crave to live a pure life. We know he is kind and will save us. In these next moments of silence, then examine let him examine us and test our deepest thoughts and emotions. Let's play it through. Keep us safe from danger as well as we dwell in your gathered flock. Amen. Open your eyes, please, and if you're comfortable to stand, please stand and we'll sing through our Mass. God will take care of you. dismayed whatever be tied God will take care of you beneath his wings of love abide God will take care of you God will take care of you through every day care of you. All you may need he will provide. God will take care of you. Nothing you ask will be denied. God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean weary one upon his breast. God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day for all the Take care.
care of you. Thank you. You may be seated. It looks like we're, PowerPoint gave up on us again. Um, so <clears throat> we were going to have you join us in the reading, but I think we'll just do it a duel so we can keep going. And when I get a break, I will try and get back there and get it re, re going again. Call to worship. Come, let us share our joy in the Lord. Let's serve him gladly. For he has made us, and we are his people. We are the sheep that he tends with great compassion through Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Whoever comes through Jesus will enter his protection and go out for his provision. We will enter worship with thanksgiving and praise. For the Lord is good. His loyal love and generous mercy remain faithful throughout the generations. Through Jesus, he calls his home by name and leads them. We follow him because we know and listen to his voice. Under his guidance, we will become one flock with one shepherd. We will receive a life of joy and abundance. Today we are looking at uh, God's provision, which biblically is often illustrated through God's care of nature and as a good shepherd cares for his flock. One of the frequent concerns that God has is that his people don't do it as well in providing for each other as he has called them to do. So here are these pieces of literature about the opposite of provision, greed and hoarding. The first is about people who grab at straws of pretense and connection so that they can get what they want. It comes from an Arab folklore featuring the widely loved wise fool Juha, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that word, name right. It's spelled D-J-U-H-A, and I went to the internet and I heard it several different ways, and none of them seemed authoritative to me. So we're going to go with Juha. One day a friend who loved to hunt came to visit Juha. I brought a rabbit I just caught, he said proudly as he stepped into the house. It will make a fine dinner. Juha gladly cooked it into a stew and they sat down to a fine feast. The next day a stranger knocked on Juha's door. Who are you? I'm a neighbor of your friend the hunter who brought you the rabbit yesterday. Juha politely invited him in and set a dinner before him. These are the leftovers of the rabbit stew, and the visitor ate heartily. The next day, another stranger knocked on Juha's door. Who are you? I am a cousin of the neighbor of your friend, the hunter, who brought you the rabbit. Come in, said Juha. He sat the man down at the table and set before him a bowl of hot water. What's this? asked the stranger. This is the water boiled in the same pot as the rabbit of my friend, who is the neighbor of your cousin. <laughs> And if we have it to give, we can't enjoy it because we are too busy guarding it. Like the toddler who can't enjoy himself because he can't let go of the toy he doesn't want to play with because he has to keep it away from another child who wants it. We've all been there, right? <laughs> but this one is used through animals and we, it's called the dog in the manger. A dog was lying in a manger full of hay. A horse, a cow, a sheep, and a goat came by one by one to eat some of the hay. But the dog sprang up growling and standing and would not let them have so much as a mouthful. The cow said to her companions, What a selfish beast! He cannot eat the hay himself, but yet neither will he let those who can. And then a poem by Sidney Dare, which indicates that temptation is within all of us. A greedy fellow, I should say, they passed the apples around this way, and then he snatched, he couldn't wait, the biggest one upon the plate. Such greediness I do despise, I had been keeping both my eyes upon that apple, you see. The plate was coming next to me. T'was big and mellow, just the kind a greedy chap would like to find. He laughed as if he thought it was fun. I meant to take that very one. We all want that one, no way. We can't just leave it with negative examples. Let's give a couple where the attitude has shifted. 
a poem by Emily Dickinson about compassionate sharing of provisions when we have the power to do so and how it adds meaning to our lives. If I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life, the aching, or cool one pain, or help the one fainting robin unto his nest again, I shall not live in vain. George Eliot also wrote two poems about it, the first stanza of the first and then selections from the second. If you sit down at the set of sun and count the acts that you have done and counting find one self-denying deed, one word that eased the heart of him who heard, one glance most kind that fell like sunshine where it went, then you may count that day well spent. Then the first stanza of a second poem wishes that people's lives be made better by their memory of the one who wrote. Encouraging them to live in pulses stirred to generosity and urging them to vaster issues, to be the cup of strength in some great agony, to enkindle generous passion and to feed pure love, to bring smiles that have no cruelty, to be the sweet presence of good diffused spread. And in the diffusion, being ever more intense, so shall I join the choir invisible, whose music is the gladness of the world. May our hearts reach for that desire of purity that we want to connect with and meet the needs of others, so that they in turn will be inspired to do the same. I'm going to sing a song for you. Since we can't see the words, if you know it, you can sing along. Oh, he got it. Good job. Okay. Um, Search me, O God. We'll sing that in preparation for prayer. Go ahead. She's going to sing it through, play it through all the way through once so we get a feel for the tune. Revival comes 
from Thee. Lord, as we look about us, we see your wisdom at work in the vast variety of works you have made, both large and small. Creatures look for you to feed them. When you provide, they gather it up and are satisfied with good things. You renew the face of the earth. We celebrate all that you have made. When we pray, may our meditations be pleasing to you. In those days we feel broken and dried up, restore and refresh our life by your word. Breathe into us again and remind us that you are our Lord, that we may again stand in strength. This is our prayer for all that we name in our heart, including these that have been named since last Sunday. A praise for David Coleman who has recovered from covid a thanks for all those who design and create the beautiful quilts that we give to those who are hurting. To the family and friends of Jim Malott's brother-in-law, Bob Sutton, who passed away. For Pat Harton's brother, David Volink, broken hip on the side of his amputated leg, and many other multiple serious health issues. And praying for the managing of pain. Continued prayers for Jim Malott's nephew, Kurt Thomas. For a friend named Debbie, who's hospitalized with multiple serious health issues, as well as COVID. May your spirit again speak to our spirits and help us to settle into your love and presence and hear what you need us to hear today. For your word is always fresh and freeing us to life and to hope as we pray the prayer your son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Something that was... Today we've been hearing how God's people depend upon him like sheep depend upon their shepherd. Mary Jo's song made it clear that it isn't only physical needs, but for emotional and spiritual needs such as identity and worth and love that builds our confidence in him and others and ourselves. Today's reading make it clear that God has chosen Jesus to shepherd all his people for all our needs. Listen. The Lord will choose one of your people to rule the nation, someone whose family goes back to ancient times. Like a shepherd taking care of his sheep, this ruler will lead and care for his people by the power and glorious name of the Lord his God. His people will live securely and the whole earth will know his true greatness because he will bring peace. So don't worry and ask yourselves, will we have anything to eat? Will we have anything to drink? Will we have any clothes to wear? Only people who don't know God are always worrying about such things. Your Father in heaven knows that you need all of these. But more than anything else, put God's work first and do what he wants. Then the other things will be yours as well. Don't worry about tomorrow. It will take care of itself. You have enough to worry about today. This is the word of God for the people oh. of God. <laughs> Sorry. I'm afraid I might have left it off your sheet, too. I don't know. It's been one of those days, I guess. 
Let's, uh, if you're comfortable to stand, stand and let's sing, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Like a shepherd, lead us much. We need thy tender care. In the pleasant pastures, feed us. For our use, thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. We are thine, thou dost befriend us, be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin, defend us. Seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thy favor, early let us do thy will, blessed Lord and only Savior, with thy love and blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. Thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, loved us still. Okay, you may be seated. A five-year-old attended a wedding with her grandmother. She'd never seen a formal worship service because their church happened to dismiss children's for children's ministry so that she wasn't in the sanctuary when the worship happened. The pastor said, let us pray. And she saw everyone bow their head toward the floor. And so in a very loud voice, she cried out, Grandma, what are they all looking for? <laughs> what are we looking for? in our prayers. Sometimes we jump immediately to our own desires and needs. Jesus, however, teaches us to first pray three requests concerning God's glory, his name, his kingdom, and his will. And having given priority to God's purposes in the world, we now turn to our own needs. Of these requests, Jesus first taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Say it with me. Give us this day our daily bread. This petition is first, not necessarily because it is the most important, but because it is the most pressing and the most distracting. A deficiency in basic needs and the anxiety it may create can take us away from seeking the more spiritual and relational needs that we may have. After we've laid these primary needs at the feet of the Father, then we can feel freer to focus on those other vital issues as well. Why should a child of the Heavenly Father even have to ask? Jerry just read that we, he already knows our needs, so why should we have to ask him? Well, besides helping us focus better on those other things that we're supposed to be seeking first, praying for our daily bread reminds us to recognize that he cares for us, he provides for us faithfully. 
We are dependent upon him and perhaps interdependent upon each other. And we can rely on him. But primarily he wants us to ask because it draws us in relationship with him. You talk because you want to talk. With this in mind, let's look at the last three words of the request backwards. So our daily bread, the first one is bread. It speaks of our basic needs, the necessities of life, primarily physical, but it can also mean spiritual, mental, emotional, as we heard in the special music. Of course, implied is an ability to discern between what is a basic need and what is a want. Or at least, I trust that God can figure that out for us and we can trust the answer that we get from him and be satisfied with that. With the relative wealth of our nation, with peers telling us what we cannot live without, with advertisers repeatedly insisting that we cannot live happily or well without their particular product, the line between need and want can easily become blurred. And we strive to surround ourselves with creature comforts and symbols of success, which we redefine as needs. Implied in this petition for bread is a contentment with the basic of life. Paul inspires us by his words in Philippians 4, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. And I'm happy either way. In some ways, we may admire the Henry David Thoreau's of the world who, by choice, have contentedly left the rat race and live very simply. Let me give you an extreme example. Back in the 1700s, John Wesley had just finished buying some pictures for his study, and he was hanging them in his study when one of the chambermaids came to the door, his external door. It was a winter day, and he noticed that she had only a thin dress to wear for protection against the cold. And so he reached into his pocket to give her some money for a coat and he found he didn't have enough. And it struck him that the Lord was not pleased with how he had spent his money. He asked himself, will you Lord say, well done, good and faithful steward, you have adorned your walls with that money that might have protected this poor creature from the cold. Oh justice, oh mercy, are not these pictures blood of this poor maid? One pastor wrote that we tend to dismiss our consciences and end our confessions before we repent, before we feel the need to share. How does one pray for daily bread when one is really looking for bread pudding? (laughs) But John Wesley wasn't like that, who at least in part may have been convicted and inspired to change his life by this unhappy incident with the chambermaid. He believed that with increased income, the standard of giving should increase, but the standard of living should not change. Early in ministry, he earned 30 pounds. That means nothing to us, but we can use it by relative to what goes after. He earned 30 pounds. He lived on 28 of them, and he gave two away. A few years later, he was making 120 pounds a year. He lived on 28 and gave 92 away. Wesley eventually became one of the wealthiest preachers of his day, yet he lived on the same basic amount of income as when he started out. To put it in somewhat more modern terms, though the numbers are even now dated, his annual income from royalties, books, pamphlets, and his ministry amounted to $160,000 a year. That's even good today. He lived like someone who earned $20,000. He took, and he had, when he died, he had only a few coins in his pocket. He took seriously the threat of the love of money. He wrote, the money never stays with me. It would burn me if it did. I throw it out of my hands as soon as possible, lest it should find its way into my heart. Wesley realized God had given him gifts beyond his needs. Therefore, he dedicated himself to reinvesting God's gifts into ministry and to others who were in need. Now, the economy of the culture of the Bible in 18th century England is certainly different than modern America, so I'm not saying that's what we should do, necessarily. But I think it should give us pause to think about what the bread principle might mean for us in our lives. Bread. 
Back up a word and you get daily. Daily provision is the norm of living for Bible times. When the Israelites were in the wilderness, they collected manna daily, except from the day before the Sabbath, and then they collect two days' worth, and if they try to get more, it just rot in their hands. Elijah was fed daily by the ravens when he was in hiding. Later, he used the last of a widow's oil and flour to make bread for one last meal, and he did it day after day after day because it never ran dry. But it was still only one day at a time. Jesus fed the multitudes the day they came out to hear him. He didn't feed them that way for the rest of the year or supply them a year's worth that day. We can trust in God's provision. For as Paul reminds us, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Romans 8.32 Trust in God's love and the ability to provide for us as we need. Jesus gives commentary on this phrase in the Lord's Prayer, which is this in essence. Because we can trust in God's love and has knowledge of our situation, we don't worry about tomorrow. Each worry, each day has enough of its own. Some people interpret this as an excuse for laziness. Don't worry about tomorrow. We'll just take it easy and live happy and just see what happens. But in other places, Jesus talks about the wisdom of planning and taking action. He's not encouraging us to not dream, to not plan, to not prepare, to not take wise precautions for the future. His call is for us not to be anxious about it while we do it, but to move ahead with trust as we align our priorities with his priorities for us and let him guide us each step of the way. Listen to Jesus' very familiar advice on how we do that in a modern paraphrase, or a version, excuse me, modern version. Store up treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy them, and thieves cannot break in and steal them. Your heart will always be where your treasure is. Your eyes are like a window for your body. When they are good, you have all the light you need. But when your eyes are bad, everything is dark. You cannot be a slave of two masters. You'll be loyal, more loyal to one than the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I tell you not to worry about your life, about having something to eat, drink, or wear. Isn't life more than food or clothing? Jesus goes on then to point us to the birds and the wildflowers to show how God takes care of them each day. And if we can trust and focus on our caregiver who values us much more than they, then we don't need to be anxious. Go back to our original exercise. If you're looking down on that flock in that lush pasture, you see the sheep content with their daily supply of food and the shepherd watching over it all. Wildflowers are growing and birds contentedly singing as you overlook this beautiful, peaceful, reassuring scene. Now imagine pulling a couple dimes out of your pocket and holding them right in front of your eyes. How much of God's beautiful landscape and care and provision can you now see? Nothing. If we focus on what we lack or what we want, but don't yet have, then we cannot see that God wants to provide or how able he is to provide it all for us. And then everything becomes dark. Hold your dime, dimes in front of your eyes for too long, you won't be able to see. Everything's dark. Bread, daily. One word before that is our what Jesus teaches us to pray for is not me or for my bread or even your bread. It is never for myself alone. And what God gives is not for myself alone. As Spiros, why do they have names like this? Zodiates, I guess, I'll take a shot at it, wrote, you cannot say the Lord's Prayer and even once say, I. You cannot say the Lord's Prayer and even once say, my. 
Nor can you pray the, Lord, pray the Lord's Prayer and not pray for one another. For when you ask for daily bread, you must include your brother. For others are included in each and every plea from beginning up to the end of it. It does not once say me. We're all on the same planet. We're all in the same boat. We succeed together and we fail together. We rejoice together and we mourn together. We pray for each other and we're called to action for each other. Therefore, we're not only to trust God, but God also gives to us in trust. He trusts that what he gives us we can use to provide for each other when he has given us the resources to do that. How can people pray for God to feed the hungry and then hoard the resources God has given us to give relief to the hungry? How can I pray for another's basic needs if I'm unwilling to be an instrument for God to help meet those needs when I'm able to do that? As one denominational confession puts it, the church gathers to praise God, the church disperses to serve God. Next week is Pentecost. Remembering when the Holy Spirit was poured out as the continuing provision of God's presence and power in the world. Not only to give comfort and inspire individuals individually, but to gather and unite all people as God's people and to enable them, to enable us, to be God's physical presence, his representatives on this earth. To go out and care and share God's love nearby, to distant places, and to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Our Father, so often we live like sheep without a shepherd, feeling uncared for and unable to help ourselves. But you raised up your Son, Jesus, to care for us like a shepherd, providing for our needs, leading us in right paths, restoring our spirits, protecting and comforting us in every circumstance we face, allowing us to dwell securely in your peace, all by the power of your glorious name. And our shepherd, our prince of peace, the bread of the world sent from heaven, you call us to carry on the work of bringing healing and wholeness to your world, which begins as you bless and bind us together in the one flock with one shepherd, Jesus Christ. Amen. As you're comfortable, please, let's stand. We'll sing, Blessed Be the Tie. Now go in the name of the God who does not withhold his love, but faithfully listens to the prayers of those who reverently worship him in awe and call out to him in praise and to each other in love.
drafting. 